Sony's PlayStation 5 console has been very interesting to cover from a technical perspective because of the lack of official information that Sony have actually provided for the PS5. Sure, Mark Cerny did do the Wired interview, and of course we had the Road to PS5 then, but very little technical deep dives from the company as to exactly what is inside the machine. If you're running a copy of Windows 10, which isn't activated, of course, not only do you have to worry about the missing customization options, but there's also that annoying Windows desktop watermark reminding you to activate. Today's video is sponsored by whokeys.com, and they have an excellent price on Windows 10 Professional, as well as home keys. Yeah, and they also, of course, sell games. I bought a few Windows 10 keys with my own personal account to test everything was legit and worked in preparation for this sponsored video. You can pick up one of their keys for 25% off using the coupon code RGT in the checkout. There's links to their website in the video description. Also, if you're building a few systems, there's bundles available too. Again, you can check out whokeys.com and use the coupon code RGT for 25% off the listed Windows 10 key prices. And this is, as I mentioned, a totally different method for marketing compared to the PlayStation 4. With the PS4, Sony were very, very, very vocal as to the customizations inside the machine. For example, Gamma Sutra ran an in-depth article with Mark Cerny explaining things such as the customizations of, for example, volatile bits. And we also saw Sony's own developers provide in-depth technical slides as to how to get the most out of the PS4. If you recall, this was a tectonic shift at the time in the industry. The PS4 and Xbox One's CPU was comparatively weedy based on the Jaguar architecture, which was a fine CPU in its own right, for example, for uh, thinner lightbook notebooks, but it wasn't an exactly a powerhouse. It was a lightweight x86 CPU, which was the best option at the time for x86 anyway that either Sony or Microsoft could use. But in terms of overall CPU grunt, it wasn't a huge amount of processing power. And this is why Sony as well as Microsoft were pushing asynchronous compute. Sony in particular were boisterous about this, cranking up the number of asynchronous compute engines and compute queues on the PS5's GPU. And all of this was readily documented from their developers, for example, Naughty Dog or Sucker Punch. It was fascinating stuff to read back in 2013 and 14 and even 15. And even when Neo launched, yeah, again, there was quite a lot of technical explanation as to what Sony had done with the machine. For example, some of the hardware changes to uh, facilitate checkerboard rendering. The term secret source is often thrown around with respect to consoles, but ultimately modern day consoles such as the PS4, Xbox One, and of course these latest systems have a lot more similarities with let's say a modern day PC compared to what we had back in the day. The PlayStation 1, the SNES, and so on were all very unique architecturally having, in some cases, bespoke hardware for their CPUs or GPUs or whatever. And it led to rather interesting and fascinating comparisons from one console to another as how they would achieve effects. There was a lot of discussion, of course, at the time, if you were alive back then anyway, of the SNES ports of games versus Sega's Genesis consoles. And sure, the SNES de did definitely have some major advantages, for example, with its ability to do Mode 7 graphics, a, a larger number of uh, colors available to games developers, and so on and so on. But the Genesis also had advantages too, with a much faster CPU. Ultimately, the design and bring up of consoles though needs to balance several factors. The first, and the most obvious one perhaps, is how much is something going to cost? There is an upper limit to the tolerance that a customer is willing to pay. Sony learned this quite painfully, of course, when they launched the PlayStation 3. It was so expensive, it really caused customers to reel, and Microsoft were all too keen to capitalize on this with the Xbox 360, which was considerably cheaper. Then there's other factors, such as power and heat. This is not only because consoles which put out a crap ton of heat, technical measurement a crap ton, is more expensive to cool, but also many countries actually have strict regulations and classifications for electronic goods. And this is for not only in idle states, but also when running games, watching movies, and so on and so on. And yeah, these are things that Sony, Microsoft, Nintendo, whomever, do need to adhere to and be cognizant of. 
Then there are other more harder to predict um, requirements such as the availability of parts, memory, plastics, the various chips inside, cooling materials, even the fans themselves, for example, the PS5, for example, outsources fans from a different number of manufacturers. And if you were an Xbox 360 owner back in the day, you'll also probably be aware that there were different uh, DVD drives available too, especially if you were um, uh, flashing your machine for... Um, uh, homebrew. That's it. For homebrew. For homebrew. But yeah. So all of these things are very important to understand because Microsoft and Sony basically have a great understanding as to what AMD's future product roadmap is. Basically, they will tell AMD that they want to release a product and insert year here. And AMD, of course, will tell them what IPs they will basically have available, what they're working on, what their targets are. And then Microsoft and Sony, of course, will have a great understanding of not only what the products that AMD will be working on for the launch date, but also future hardware as well. And this means that Sony and Microsoft can also do things like customize the SOC, we'll get into that further in just a moment, or even request features to be added for AMD's IP possibly, which might influence the desktop. And we've seen this previously from both Sony as well as Microsoft, and it's pretty typical within the industry. Getting back to the custom side of things, so when AMD essentially has a piece of IP, we'll say a CPU for the sake of argument, along with other bits, which then it can throw together for one of its customers, we'll say Sony, Sony will then work with AMD's custom team. And this custom team, of course, will work with Sony to basically produce the larger SOC. Now, I am vastly simplifying a large number of steps here just to keep everyone onto the same page. And I'm missing a lot of technical explanation. If you really want, you can Google it yourself. But again, I don't want to go into the whole nitty gritty of how silicon design and how bring ups work because, well, I'd probably be here for the next like 20 minutes just trying to go over the basics. But long story short, Sony, Microsoft, AMD, they all kind of work collaboratively together when they're designing their SOC. And this, of course, is outside of things that, for example, Microsoft or Sony will want to implement themselves. For example, Microsoft did a lot of work with the uh, audio chips inside the uh, Xbox Series X, for example. And of course, this was incorporated into the larger SOC, which was being designed. Again, I am simplifying things, but I just want you guys to get the basic understanding. So the purpose, of course, of customizing hardware is because ultimately you are designing a console or whatever the specific purpose of a item is for. So, for example, with a PlayStation 5, it doesn't really need to do, do a whole bunch of other stuff other than run games, right? I mean, sure, you want it to do things like run Netflix and stuff, but obviously watching a Blu-ray or perhaps... I don't know, browsing the internet or whatever, whatever is not particularly too taxing. Instead, what you're really doing is wanting to make every single square millimeter of silicon in your console as effective as possible for running games and also as power efficient as possible, while also adhering to the requirements that I mentioned earlier, such as having mass production parts available for whatever timeline you're trying to release your console and so on and so on. Recently, high resolution die shots of the PlayStation 5 have been available. Honestly, I think these things are marvelous to look at whenever we see high resolution die shots of chips. Personally, I think that they look beautiful. And even if you're not so familiar with what you're looking at from a technical uh, level, I think they look pretty. Well, <laughs> at least I think they look pretty. I think they almost look like some abstract piece of art, especially if you're looking at like, say, AMD's uh, RDNA 2 architecture, Zen, NVIDIA's RTX 30 series. I think they look really cool architecturally. And it gives you a great understanding as to the work that's actually involved in creating these things. The, the years of work and dedication it takes for these engineers to actually build something that actually works. And honestly, it's really cool when you think about it. When taking these die shots, well, unfortunately, the console they come from is actually destroyed. So hopefully, in some cases, of course, the PS5, for example, which was donating its sock was like dead or something like that. But 
the photographer will undergo a painful process, painstaking, to prep the silicon for the imagery that we're seeing here. Unfortunately, we don't have official documentation as to what exactly the bits of the die are, so we're left to a degree to do some guesswork and comparisons of either the desktop or mobile iterations of hardware. For example, the Zen 2 CPU inside the PlayStation 5 is fairly well documented for its PC and mobile iterations, Renoir, so it's not too difficult to draw some comparisons to understand some of the changes in the bits of the chip. Now, I want to stress before we go any further, a lot of this stuff that I'm about to say is kind of based on die shots and guesses and so on and so on. And unfortunately, Sony have not provided us a great number of technical explanations as to what has actually gone inside the PlayStation 5. Now, I would encourage you to watch the Road to PS5 event after this video, then re-watch the Road to PS5 event, and then probably re-watch the PS5 event again, because there are some very interesting things that Sony does mention, and we can kind of get an idea of what's working inside the PS5. For example, I believe he mentions that the CPU is capable of 256-bit operations. I'm sure it was there, he said it. It was somewhere or another, but I think it was there. He also provides some information regarding the uh, Tempest engine and how that actually works. It's basically a kind of tweaked version of the uh, compute units that we're seeing inside RDNA. However, interestingly, it uses DMA, direct memory access, which we're now starting to actually learn anyway from these uh, kind of sock photos, because basically you can see that there's no cache, which people like Lacuza have actually noted. And yet again, that was actually mentioned in the Road to PS5 event. Unfortunately, the Road to PS5 event, in my personal opinion, wasn't perfect. I think that there was a lot of technical jargon that a lot of folks would not have understood, and it also didn't go deep enough, for example, like nerds like me would have possibly wanted. So it was kind of this middle ground. I'll also say that one of my working theories for quite a while was that Sony didn't actually go further with breakdowns for the PlayStation 5 because of the poor reception and the misunderstandings of the Road to PS5 event. However, I'm told that this is not actually the case. One person has told me that this is not the reason that Sony didn't do any more. Now, another person did tell me that they had planned it, and I don't know whether that's true. So all I can say is, from my working theory at the moment, is that the reception of the Road to PS5 was not the reason that Sony did it, and someone else is telling me that they had planned it. Now, it's possible it just never really happened because, you know, of world events and stuff, but I honestly don't know, so I'm just putting that out there. I genuinely don't know why Sony did not provide extra details to the PlayStation 5. Whether they're going to do that in the future, I don't know. In fact, two days after I put this video up, I think my luck, because I'm going on vacation, um... Yeah, well, this week anyway. If you're watching this, you know, next year or something. Well, I'm recording this in, like, September 2021. So if you're watching this later on, obviously I'm back from vacation. I'm just saying, though, that this stuff could quickly become outdated as, for example, something major leaks and so on and so on. So, yeah, I want to touch on a few things that people have been discussing about the PlayStation 5, and some of these conversations I have been tagged in. In fact, I've been meaning to do this video for a while, and I'll also be doing a follow-up for the GPU. And the GPU stuff is a lot more complicated to discuss, honestly. Um, so I will be discussing that in a future video, but yeah, I kind of wanted to put the CPU thing out first because I'd already touched on some of this stuff previously, but now we have further clarification. So anyway, as I uh, just mentioned a moment ago, Nakuza and others were doing comparisons of the die shots we've seen between desktop and laptop iterations of Zen 2. Now, I want to be clear here, both Sony and Microsoft do have changes in their CPUs versus either the desktop or the laptop implementations. For example, they've cut the amount of L3 cache. And the reason they've done this, well, is basically space on the die. Essentially, the amount of L3 cache for the desktop iteration of a Zen 2 CCX, you can just see how much proportionally of the space it takes up compared to, let's say, the CPU cores. Essentially, you have a trade-off here, and you need to say, well, at what point does all of this die space being used for cache actually not make sense 
and instead it's better to do other things or to concern ourselves with things such as yields. There's a reason, for example, that there's actually 56 compute units on the Xbox Series X, but Microsoft have disabled four of them, and this leaves, you know, 52, and Sony actually have 40, but there's 36 enabled. It is, of course, for things such as yields. In other words, if a part, if a bit, of the sock is damaged, then it's not such a big deal. The whole thing can't be thrown away. On the other hand, if a portion of, let's say, cache is damaged, or say a CPU core is damaged, and you've only got eight of them and you need all eight, well, I think you can kind of get where I'm going with this. For Sony anyway, according to what we're seeing here, there seems to be a rather large amount of custom work done to the FP floating point areas of the CPU. Now, Lacusa had originally thought that FP units were cut to 128B, but this does not seem to be true. In fact, he's corrected himself. It seems to be 256B, but yeah, it seems also that they're a lot denser. This is the floating point units. Clam Chowder on Twitter also did some really nice diagrams as well. And you can see that the density does seem, well, tensor. Um, it's possible that Sony have adjusted the number of registers. In fact, I think they have more on that in a second, but it's not 100% clear. To my understanding, Sony have made numerous changes to the SIMD capabilities of the PS5 CPU, but they should not impact the games. Modern day consoles will shift SSE instructions, for example, to asynchronous compute workloads on the GPU. Basically, Sony seems to have changed the CPU design to be more in line with reducing power consumption to keep the frequencies as high as possible for the GPU. Remember, the PS5 SOC does not work on uh, heat um, constraints, but instead power constraints. Basically, the more power which is available to the SOC, the higher the GPU and CPU can run. However, if you start bombarding the CPU with tons of AVX, or SSE instructions, should I say, this can have the impact of actually reducing the power uh, available to the CPU, uh, sorry, to the GPU. Now, Cerny did say that reducing the power actually has a quite negligible effect on GPU frequencies. He said, I think it was like 10% reduction in power to the GPU would only impact frequencies a tiny little bit, a couple of percent. And you can start to actually see how this might be true if you've ever started to undervolt a Radeon GPU. And in fact, actually undervolting Radeon GPUs for desktop can sometimes have some quite positive impacts in frequency and uh, overall temperatures. However, again, this is a console, so things do work a little bit differently, with Sony essentially using a modified enhanced version of their SmartShift technology, which again is quite well known in laptops. So, what does all of this mean? Bottom line, well, it's likely, and again, I stress likely, Sony have made reductions in the FP registers, but Ultimately, the functionality of the chip is still pretty much identical. This means that SSE heavy code would theoretically run slower on the PS5 compared to, let's say, the Xbox, because the PS5 CPUs has fewer registers for this type of instruction. But the reality is Sony would probably encourage developers to not write that code anyway, because they would think that it's not efficient. So for example, Sony, as well as Microsoft, were very smart this generation, and they threw stuff into their console to run decompression, data decompression, on, well, decompression blocks, because just trying to run all of that stuff on the CPU would... <laughs> Well, you would need to basically double the number of CPU cores to keep up with that, and it's not efficient. So both Sony and Microsoft were like, yeah, let's probably not do that. Let's incorporate hardware decompression. And obviously, this has been something that's very important for both systems. And in the case of, you know, both consoles as well, they can leverage things like GPU compute, for example, for physics and whatever else. And yeah, they can start tying that in to other parts of the, you know, rendering of a frame. And yeah, it's just much more efficient, much more power efficient compared to actually running all of that stuff on the CPU. It's worth also noting that there is the AMD 4700S. We believe this is a PS5 SOC with parts of the SOC disabled, such as, for example, the GPU. It ships with 16 gigabytes of GDDR6 memory. They're essentially kits. And exhaustive benchmarks of this might prove further insights as to what exactly Sony have done to the PF5 CPU versus, let's say, Renoir. Unfortunately, specific benchmarks 
Well, this is more generic in terms of workloads. In other words, we could write a benchmark or run specific benchmarks on the CPU to get a better understanding, but it's not necessarily going to tell us how a PS5 would run because it's not how a developer necessarily would want to write a game for a PS5. It's still, however, from, you know, just an intellectual point of view, would be interesting to see what Sony have done with the PS5. And it does seem that there is heavy customization throughout the PS5 SOC, much like Microsoft's. Also, there is another thing I want to talk about the PS5, and that's the L3 cache. So I mentioned about this already in another video. I'll try to remember to link it in the description. But basically, it was said that the PS5's uh, memory is essentially unified. I believe it was Michael NXG who first mentioned this, if memory serves. I think he was the first person who really started talking about it on Twitter and then the conversation picked up, but I might be misremembering that, but I'm pretty sure it was Michael. Either way, um, yeah. So, from what I understand, it basically seems that the L3 cache of the CPU, which remember is not exactly huge, it's only 8 megabytes, which is pretty small, can essentially be accessed by the GPU. Now, previous to the PS5 being launched, I had been told that there were heavy modifications to the PS5's cache, especially L3, and I was told that it was kind of unified. Now, this I kind of got mixed up with with another source, and I thought unified meant L3 caches of the PS5 CPU were more like Zen 3 CPU, but this is probably untrue. And I've since been told that the L3 cache of PS5 is indeed more unified, but now I'm starting to think that this actually means that the CPU and GPU essentially can access the L3 cache. Now understand that this is not for the same reasons of Infinity Cache on a desktop. Infinity Cache we'll talk more about in just a moment, although Infinity Cache is also available on AMD's mobile chips as well. Instead, I believe this is more likely an evolution of some of the stuff that Sony were doing on the PS4, basically like data sharing between the CPU and GPU. Unfortunately, I don't have an in-depth technical explanation as to what this could be. It could be an evolution of volatile bit, for example. But again, I don't really want to start to throw out speculation here because I've been told a few things and honestly, I'm not convinced any of them is true or perhaps some of it is true and it's modeled. So I don't want to say it in a video because then I'll get like quoted and it becomes a whole thing. But I do believe it's probably an evolution of what Sony has done with the PS4. However, it's not unified like, let's say, in, um, or quite in the same way as you would expect, let's say, L3 cache of Zen 3. It's very different. Well, the L3 cache of Zen 3 basically is unified between the CCXs. Also, while we're talking about caveats, Again, this is not a huge data cache for the GPU, and it's not the same thing as Infinity Cache. Now, I know I just said that, but there's a lot of discussion as to the PS5 and Series X and the absence of Infinity Cache, which is part and parcel of PC slash mobile parts. Basically, for the RX 6800, for example, and above, you have 128 megabytes of Infinity Cache. And this makes up for the lack of GDDR6 bandwidth on AMD's uh, GPUs. Meanwhile, Sony and Microsoft have plenty of bandwidth, even if you take into account, say, bandwidth for the CPU and other stuff in the system to feed their GPU, generally speaking. So, for example, if we look at the Xbox Series X not having Infinity Cache, well, compare the Xbox Series X in terms of T-flops, for example, against the 6800 XT, which has 20 uh, T-flops of performance, thanks to 72 compute units running over 2200 megahertz. By the way, you can easily overclock a 6800 way over 2200 megahertz. Uh, this one, he says hits like 2600, 2700 without too much difficulty. And I actually had the same thing when AMD sent over their 6800 XT as well, especially if you're willing to kind of start modding and messing around. Uh, pro tip, if you do own an AMD graphics card and you're willing to start messing around, you can start doing soft modding with um, uh, more power tool. It's really interesting to kind of see what you can actually get out of it. And it scales very well because it's increasing the clock frequency as well as the infinity cache. But again, that's just an aside. So the GDDR6 memory of the 6800, for example, is putting out just 512 gigabytes per second. So the infinity cache, which you can see in these slides, by the way, 
prior to the launch of RDNA 2 and the announcement, I was actually the first to leak Infinity Cache and how it worked, and also the performance benefits. So basically, Infinity Cache essentially acts like, I guess, almost like a buffer. And I think that's just about it for this video. Honestly, it's kind of turned out a bit lengthier than what I anticipated, and yes, that's what she said. Uh, there will be a follow-up to this next week or two, possibly. Uh, so do, of course, look out for it. There's also going to be a ton of other projects on the channel in the next while. Things have been a bit quieter as I'm prepping for holiday at the moment, but, you know, normal service shall resume soon. With that said, thank you very much for checking out the video. I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.